I sometimes feel as if I live two lives. The one is being a mother and the other is being a science journalist. It's one of the most fun jobs I think there can be in life. I get to ask people who know a vast amount of things and I get to ask them, that's my one life, um, I get to ask them questions until I understand what they are talking about and about their research and then I get to write about it in such a way that hopefully other people understand what they are doing and it's a really it's one of the coolest jobs I know of. It gets me into a wheat field on a Monday morning to take photographs. Why not? Why should I have an office job? My other job is being a mother. So on normally about one o'clock in the afternoon, my work stops and I become a dedicated mom's taxi. I ferry my children to ballet. I have two daughters. I ferry them to ballet, to choir practice, to athletics, whatever it should be today. And I must admit, in between, I often check my emails just to make sure that everything's in control. And so I go on. And um, I don't know, I, most of you probably have children, and most of you have, who have been there know that a school gate is probably one of the places where gossip and fear-mongering and curious stories abound. It's the place where I often have to literally stand and grit on my teeth. Or sometimes I'll just stay in my car and just check my emails and not chat to people. Because it, often they, it's a place where people just they have too many stories and it's never based on fact. It's, I just bite on my teeth. But sometimes you cannot actually... I try to um, keep my two lives <coughs> apart, but it's not always possible. And early in this year, um, it wasn't possible for me to, my two lives collided. So my science writing life and my mother life collided, my parental roles collided. And all the parents want, started telling me about fidget spinners and my children also started um, speaking about fidget spinners. I don't know who of you are sitting next to people. Who, um, can I just have a show of hands of the people who have fidget spinners with them? Um, there's a few examples around. So it's basically like I'm going to leave my mic now and just demonstrate. Basically what you do is you go like this and you go like this and if you're really cool you can do a manner of pricks and you can even balance it on your nose and stuff like that. Anyway that's the basics of a fidget spinner. I don't know, I know of people who have at least 10 in their homes because it's, it was the done thing to have at some stage. Um, the New York Times called it the hula hoop of the generation X. Um, at some stage, about May this year, it cornered about 20% of the toy market in America. Um, they estimate that there was sold between 19 million and 50 million of them um, just in the 12 richest countries in, in the world. Um, and yeah, everyone wanted to do it. And all the parents came to me and said, so why aren't you writing about the fidget spinners? They're so great. It's helping a lot for my children's ADHD. And all the experts are saying it's helping for autism. It makes people less anxious. It's helping me to stop smoking. I'm not biting my nails anymore. It was wonderful. And I started wondering, so why am I not writing about this? Anyway, um, I, I started wondering about what is behind a fidget spinner, so I started reading up a little bit on it because I'm a supposedly um, ordentlika mother who um, follows my head and not necessarily just the nagging of my children. I try my best. Um, so I started looking around and I started wondering how did this happen. So I went to the New York Times and they said that about in around 2007, small scale manufacturers started making a whole variety of fidget spinners. And the, the market grew and subsequently more and more models came onto the market. Um, by 2016 December, a guy wrote on Forbes.com um, that the fidget spinner is actually 2017's must-have office toy. And if you don't have one, you just don't have one. Yeah? And he said they tested it in their office and quite a few people got it and that's what they said. It made them feel more present, they were dumping their energy into fidgeting, they didn't go to the pantry anymore so, so often. So that's great. 
I think, if you weight watching and stuff. And then my favorite quote from him is one of the reasons he liked it so much is that he went from short nails and raw skin to being able to squeeze a lemon into a glass of water with no problem. That's great. So that's wonderful, anecdotal. But so he had his peer group checking it out. And I, I realize it's only a toy, but sometimes uh, being only a toy, millions are being sold. I, I prefer some evidence. And especially because um, people were starting to write um, that fidget spinners are a medical device. So, and people said, it's, some people called it, it's not a, a, um, just a toy, they called it a remedi, remedi, rem, ooh, that, the, that word, that word. Um, it's, it's educational and frankly, it shouldn't be called a toy, it should be called a tool. No, it, it's lovely. Um, so I started um, looking on, on I, have my, I call the peer-reviewed system and I call Google Scholar my personal um, safety blanket. It, life isn't perfect, but at least, and I know all studies aren't perfect, and Mandy, you've shown that to us, all studies aren't perfect, but um, there are some places where I can start going to look for stuff and so for some sa type of safety blanket to make my decisions more informed. So I went to Google Scholar, that was about April, and I started looking and there was nothing. No, no study had been done on fidgeting, or fidget spinners specifically. By October, I was really in luck. There was a, one paper and it said, <coughs> yes, fidget spinners, um, and I'm going, it's a study on fidget spinners, and I was really I'm, I'm glad about it. This one only had an impact factor of 2.234, but at least it was there. But it was unfortunately only a review saying, no, fidget, there are no research on fidget spinners. And they said, as the benefits of fidget spinner use have yet to be substantiated, the, the um, merits are not necessarily so many as you might see or might think. And that corroborates what my eight-year-old daughter one day came to school, um, back from school, and she said, she's not understanding this whole fidget spinner craze. Because everyone now has it, because it's supposed to calm them and help them to concentrate. But she can't concentrate because everyone's spinning it around her. And it's taking away her concentration. So she's not, uh, and that was my personal peer-reviewed study. Anyway, or at least it was my personal uh, eight-year-old study um, and very anecdotal definitely um, I'm not the I wasn't the first person to realize that there's no science behind this and yet again it's just a toy it's not a it's not harming anyone except maybe parents who now have to pay between 100 and 300 rand for a little toy um, there was a guy called um, Sean Gregory in the Time magazine and he actually his paper was headlined the shoddy science behind the fidget spinners and he said at least 10 companies on Amazon marketed it as a medical device and then I become yeah then it doesn't become so much then it doesn't become a toy for me anymore a harmless toy people start marketing it as such and that's what he also said. He said was, it wasn't developed by people with um, a deep intellectual uh, who are behavioral scientists. So I started wondering, so who did um, develop it? Now, depending on who you, um, which source you go to, Wikipedia, um, New York Times, and The Guardian all cite uh, this lady, <coughs> Catherine Hittinger, as the developer. And depending on which story you also read, there was, there's two stories. On the one, she developed it because she wanted to uh, further world peace. She was in Israel, saw people throwing rocks at the policemen, and thought, yes, let me develop something else so that people don't start um, throwing rocks at the policemen, but that they channel their energy into a fidget spinner. That's the one version. The more popular version is that she developed it one summer when she was ill and she had to uh, occupy a child. So she filed a patent in 1993 for a spinning toy. Um, if you check, um, the, a little girl is holding what she says is her spinning toy. It looks like a cross between, between a UFO and a um, frisbee made of clay in which you've pressed your hand, something like that. So it's a spinning toy, 
but it doesn't really resemble this. If you have a, yeah, and there's different varieties of this. <coughs> and then um, Wikipedia listed her as the inventor and she thought it was funny and maybe a joke of some of her friends. And then New York Times came to her and she did an interview. And then The Guardian came to her and she did an interview and said, yes, cool. I'm so sorry, I'm the inventor, I held a patent and I didn't get any of the money for this. Because in 2005, her, her money ran out and she, her patent lapsed. So this could be the classic story of a inventor who's, who's just not credited for, um, for the invention. George listed that as one of the reasons why people sometimes um, feel offended about certain science stories. Um, but it wasn't like that. About three weeks after the New York Times story, Bloomberg comes around and says, hey, but you're not the inventor. Actually, your spinning toy and your patent doesn't look like the original one at all. You cannot say that. And she says, yes, actually, it is true. I'm not the inventor. I just thought it was nice that people listed me on Wikipedia. And if you still go to Wikipedia, she's still listed as the inventor. That's beside the point. Um, so I again asked myself, so why didn't I write about it? And, and it is, there's certain reasons for it. I, I'm that type of personality that likes facts. That's one of the reasons I'm a, um, not a mom, mommy blogger, blogger. I'm into science writing. I like writing about facts. I like finding out little bits of things and I like writing about that. And I could be frivolous and say that one of the reasons I'm a mommy blog, I'm not a mommy blogger, is because I like my privacy and I like my family's privacy. But that's not that. I, I like facts and I like the security of working in a system where there is some evidence, where there is some facts and there are certain things. And um, someone um, mentioned yesterday that that whole curiosity factor. I am a curious person. I like finding out stuff. I don't like, want to know everything. Um, that's not why I'm into science writing. I like the fact that there's certain bits of science that I can find out and I can talk to people and then they can tell me a little bit of a little bit of a lot. And that's the part I like. So that's why I'm um, in it. There's a blogger called Sai Babe. Now, I'm Sai Vrai, but there's also a blogger called Sai Babe. And she once wrote about mommy bloggers and the whole credibility issue. And that's one of the reasons I'm uh, not into that type of writing. It's about credibility and about the whole spreading of uh, misinformation. And it can be sometimes dangerous. And Mandy, you have shown that the peer-reviewed system isn't um, always quite right there, depending on your journal and where you publish, but it is my personal safety blanket and I'm comfortable with that. Um, Lauren Stevens wrote in the Huffington Post, she wrote an article um, about the dark side of mommy blogging and she gave some advice to parents um, when they go on the internet and go in search of information, what is the type of information that they might want to consider when they read a blog, say they go to natural news, is that the type of news that they should read? And she gave them this, um, these, this checklist. It's not a perfect checklist, and I think the one that George had earlier today is a much better one, but three points is maybe the perfect thing. Um, so it's about reputable proof, evidence being evidence-based, having reviews and meta-analysis in place. And those are often the, um, that's the type of re reasoning behind how we as Cybri decide what type of stories we are going to follow. That's why we are not writing about fidget spinners. That's uh, why probably often we do not, yeah, uh, many, of, many of the dicey topics is not something that we will cover. We're lucky that many of the volunteers that work with me um, that many of them have a scientific background. So they have a uh, good idea of peer-reviewed papers. Some of them, even two of them, actually have a master's degree in science. Um, so they actually know mostly what we are doing, hopefully. Um, we're all in the science communication business. And one of the reasons why we... Let me first give you a quick rundown of Cybro. So we started in about 2014. 
um, we, 2013, sorry, and we're entirely voluntary driven. Um, it started um, because we believe we are all working in the field of science communication, science writing or science journalism. And it's, we find that it's an extreme <coughs> privilege to be able to work with scientists and to work with some of the brightest minds in South Africa. It's not a privilege that many people have in their jobs. And it's a, it's a privilege that you, we wanted to share with others. Um, the name, I should probably, I don't know how many people are here that's not from South Africa, but basically the name is kind of self-explanatory if you're South African. Sai, of course, refers to science. A braai would be in American, um, that a barbecue would be the equivalent of a braai. Now, a braai is the one thing that I think most South Africans have in common, except maybe if you're vegetarian, then you might have a problem. Um, but it's the act of cooking something, cooking food. But it's more than just food. It's also about that whole thing about gathering around a fire and chatting and sharing short stories and telling people about Zuma and Guptas and the President's Keepers and I think this weekend there was lots of stories about the Fana Bafana's poor performance and then there were stories about the spring box and people shared their thoughts about bit normal things. And our, <coughs> our thing with Cybra is we want to, our payoff line is round the fire stories about science and South African science and South African scientists. And we'd like to next time you go to, a, to your braai and take your salads and take your sides and your braai broikies and you start chatting to people that you also mention stuff that you've actually learned during the course of the week. It doesn't have to be on, on side braai but get, chat about other stuff too. And there's, there's um, George often referred to Bob, Bobby van Jarschwald and my favorite line when I tell people about side braai is, you know, there's more to life than Bobby van Jarschwald and rugby. And I love rugby, not Bobby van Jarschwald, but, but my children on, on the other hand, but, but we're working on that, we're working on them. Um, but there is more to life than doom and gloom in South Africa. And I think in many instances, Cybra is my proudly South African initiative. I want to stay in this country. Ooh, and I should definitely get teary about this. But that's, that's something I want to do. And to stay here, I have to stay positive. And I cannot understand why we, in the media, constantly feed each other with so much negative news when there's a room full of people doing really amazing work. But people are not interested in focusing on that. I cannot understand that. And maybe I'm naive. And maybe I'm now starting to blush. <coughs> but you know, so be it. That, this is where I want to be. And I, want to, I choose to write about people. I don't, I don't want to necessarily change people's minds about the type of signs they should believe. I want to change people's <coughs> minds about the fact that there are people working hard in my country, trying to find out stuff how to solve AIDS, and how to make, uh, solve the TB crisis. There's people who have developed apps that they can t take to rural places on their cell phones and test people's hearing. Uh, um, hearing yeah? There's people who have developed apps to test water. Um, it's amazing stuff that people are doing. And I think we are feeding each other so many constant dooms and gloom stories that we become in depressed and want to immigrate. And that's not necessarily... And I, I'm not saying that the Guptas are not reality. And I'm not saying that there's certain other realities that we really face. But we don't need to do that constantly. Um, in Nelson Mandela, in 1996, he launched the Academy of Science of South Africa. And he said, we need to be... Um, science ought to be, become part of our national pride. And we, I think we will always be remembered as the country where the first heart plant was done. We're also the country where the first penis transplant was done, but that's a slightly more difficult sell, um, especially if you're writing children's stories and things like that. <laughs> anyway, um, 
we're also the country where the bigger part of the SKA project is. Um, and um, Bernie Fanaroff was the guy who, that brought the whole initiative and ran the whole initiative to bring it to South Africa. He's a firm believer that a Nobel Prize will be um, presented to the SKA for research that's going to be done there. That's, that's what he firmly believes. And he's an astronomer, so it's not a thumbs up from his, on, on, on his behalf. He knows what he's doing. Now, um, one of the reasons I, th I think people should write more about science, and maybe I'm not now, yeah, I'm, I'm more talking about national pride than pseudoscience, but anyway, one of the reasons I think people should write more about science, because there's something in it, is in 2014, um, the Human Sciences Research Council did, did a study about the fact, what is the stuff that makes us proud as a nation? What's the type of thing that, that lifts us slightly off the doom and gloom um, graph for a little, a little while each day? Now, 88% said it was sport. I think it was a good season for the Springboks that year. So maybe, yeah. <coughs> I don't know why, but I, sport is a unifying um, thing in South Africa. Art, literature, and history took 77% of all people, and 74% of all people said our scientific endeavors is something that makes them proud. Now, if 77% of all people say that's something that makes them proud, then I think that 77% of all newspapers should cover science. But I do realize that my maths are not my strongest point. So this is our science um, side ride. Most of our volunteers, um, that's Paul Kennedy and Anina and Stephen Mum, and Sibs um, Bayela. He's the guy that writes our Zulu column. And we have the only Zulu science column in the world, of course. <laughs> um, I have to say it like that. So what do we carry? We're an we're a, um, open source um, publication. So anything we carry, you may carry. Eh? This is an open invitation. And we don't carry a lot. We, we are able to write about 20 to 30 percent of our own um, work. But as mentioned, we're totally voluntary. We have no budget. We have done what we have done so far. In between a pregnancy, not mine, to raising two children, keeping our marriages safe, stable, and doing our own jobs. But it's something that we really believe in. So we carry um, news stories. Then we have the sci cyber science signs. I hope you catch the, the sides part, like you bring a salad and a and a fry brookies. That's a fry side, anyway. So we um, use that um, to highlight new peer-reviewed research papers that have not otherwise received any media <coughs> attention. A lot of really great work is being done at our universities and our research institu institutions to spread science news into our local newspapers. I, it's this yet again another thumbs up. I think 95% of science stories that are written in South Africa as at some, in some way has its source um, at, a, at the comms um, team of a research institution or a university. If they didn't do it, there would be no research in or science in our, um, or make it 95%. There would only be 5%. 5% of all stories are actually started at a, a, um, a certain journalistic level. I'm not saying that's true of all publications, but most publications. Then we also have this essay science hero snippet on Facebook and Twitter, and in that way we are able to highlight a persona, one, once, one person per day, hopefully. And for that we use aggregated co copy from research institutions or, or universities that we trust. Um, we, we, I cannot see why universities in South Africa will really punt weird stuff, because it's not, it would be to their detriment, and therefore I need to trust them. We also have this SA Science Legends profile series, it's um, based on the profiles that are currently in the Academy of Science of South Africa's um, book, um, Legends, of South Af South South Legends of South African Science. 
And, it's the, and, and in that way we are becoming, so once a week we have one profile in, and in that way we are sharing stories about South African scientists who have made their mark. There's 53 of them, so we're doing that for the next year. And then we've also been able to have some data quests with journalists and actual prize where we brought in scientists and stu scholars together. But that's, for that we need a budget which we don't have. One of the saddest sentences I've read um, today, uh, and this year was this sentence from Donay Tor, it, and in English it means that it's actually cheaper to write fake news than it is to write real, do real reporting. And that's true, but it is sad. And that's why one of the reasons we will keep on doing what we are doing. Because we want, even if it's like 1% of what we are able to write about, about South African science, that's what we want to do, to be able to influence that. Just in closing, um, Fanny van Rooyen did a thesis on science journalism and tweeting, and he said people go to Twitter and they retweet the sources that are, they trust. And he said that trust is becoming a commodity on Twitter. So if you're a, if you're a brand or institution or a research um, organization, they, people will retweet your science and news because they trust you. And we want to become that. And it's, we're working towards that, and one day we might be. And I want to end off with what Naledi Pandor, our Minister of Science and Technology, said one, um, at the end of last month. She, it was a really hard day in Stellenbosch. Those of you from outside of Stellenbosch, it's difficult for you to think that now. But it was really hot. It was a Monday morning, and it was the launch of a wheat breeding platform. The idea was, well, the idea is they were um, biotech guys are working towards um, increasing he the yield of our wheat production. And she started off in her um, set speech, but before she did that, she said, uh, so that she spent the whole morning asking the scientists and the people involved questions about what they are doing. And then she starts, stopped her speech and she said, I'm glad that I'm a curious politician. I go out there and I find out what is happening. So when I listen to all of your pessimistic, pessimistic talk, I know there's another part of South Africa. I think you should all start to get curious and find out a bit more about our country. Because there are so much happening out there if you just opened your eyes and went out and got to know what is happening in a range of sectors. You will be amazed. So stop relying on fake news because really, it is fake. Now I understand that there's a lot of political speak in that. But I do believe her, and, and, that, that, uh, and that's the type of thing that motivates me, and that motivates us as Cybri to do our thing, because we can, and it's fun. <laughs>